Hello, and welcome to this edition of Secure Networks, the Index Packet Forensic Files with your host, Michael Morris. Our special guest for this episode is Alex Kirk, Global Principal Engineer for Corelight. Alex, welcome. Thank you for joining. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Thanks. Good to be here. Um, so I guess I would describe myself as an open source uh, commercial security guy. Uh, and by that, really, I mean I've worked for a series of companies that took a popular open source product and put a commercial wrapper around it. Uh, so 10 years with Sourcefire's research arm, um, where I did everything from standing up our first malware sandbox to putting together our global uh, Intel sharing program. Um, and then later time at uh, Cisco as an SE uh, through that acquisition, and then uh, on to Tenable for a while uh, with the, the whole Nessus product line before showing up to work with Zeke and Suricata here at Corelight. Excellent, man, you've got the real diverse background, which is why we're really happy to have you on this edition. Uh, Alex, you've kind of become an expert in the SolarWinds sunburst attack. Share with us some details of the complexities of this, this breach and why are supply chain components growing as targets or vehicles for gaining access to networks? So, so really those are kind of one and the same in terms of the answer um, <laughs> in that, you know, this came down as a digitally signed DLL from a trusted vendor. Um, and so you as a system administrator would have really had no reason to suspect that anything funny was going on with these boxes. Um, and that's part of the allure of, of supply chain attacks from an attacker perspective is if they can find a way to get into that one vendor and have something sneaky come down to their entire customer base of potentially thousands or tens of thousands of folks, they can do it in that, that trusted sort of mechanism that allows them to have a head start on actually doing something nasty on networks. Um, but you know, it's it's been, I think, a thing on attackers' minds for a long time. I remember even 10 years ago while I was attending the Eco Party Security Conference down in Buenos Aires, they were talking about how awesome it would be if you could compromise uh, security update tools <laughs> and other sorts of automated code pull downs because of just how sneaky you could be as a result. Right. No, that's it. what's I think surprising to a lot of non-technical folks is why did it take so long for so many experts that are monitoring so many infrastructures to detect this breach? I mean, it was really in existence for months, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a solid nine months that it was out there in the wild. Um, and I, I really think it speaks to the fact that there's there's so much to monitor, for one, that it's difficult to focus in on any one thing. Um, but two is, is that there's that trust factor um, that was already in place. People weren't thinking about you know vendor tools as, as a potential entry point into the network. So I, I think that the level of scrutiny that your average laptop that shows up on the corporate network, but has been to heaven knows whatever other places is going to get. Um, and, you know, it's kind of ironic in that we've all become very good at securing all of our servers and, and you know, devices that we stand up to run our enterprise. Uh, but we kind of take for granted that the devices that are coming from third parties that are integral parts of our network um, are, are secured by those vendors and that we don't really need to worry about it. Um, and so I think that a lot of the, the sorts of hygiene stuff that could have easily spotted this earlier on just wasn't being done to those devices because people were focusing on other more suspect areas of the network. No, that's, that's great insights. And along those lines, uh, another thing we often take for granted is, is something like DNS. And I know you all talk about this a lot, DNS spoofing and, and hiding exfiltration data in DNS traffic is also something we, we take for granted DNS as a service, right. but it's, it's a growing technique or vehicle for malware and threat actors. Was, was DNS spoofing a, a part of this breach and how are you seeing this as a, uh, as a threat to organizations and how are people approaching this problem? Well, so yeah, DNS was absolutely an important part of this breach. Um, it was more on the kind of command and control side than the exfiltration, which actually took place mostly over SSL. Um, but you know, the answers to the queries that were being made were being used to actually relay, you know, what kinds of actions the malware should be taking, 
Um, and it, it's beautiful because unless you knew what those IP address ranges actually meant to the command and control structure, you'd have no way to tell, you know, that those were any different from any other DNS query out there. Um, what I did find interesting, and, and it's something that can be kind of useful going forward, is that uh, one of our, our customers at Corelight was actually kind enough to ship us some of their logs that they had in place from our appliance during the attack so that we could analyze them and, and kind of understand this whole thing better. Um, and we found that a lot of those devices were actually making queries to non-corporate owned DNS servers. So, and in fact, one particular one stood out that was hosted up in AWS. Um, and, you know, so just looking for hygiene sorts of things like that, where, you know, it's, it's one thing, again, if your average endpoint client is, is making a DNS request off to a non-authorized server, you, you can, you know, squish that or not, depending upon how policy oriented your environment is. Um, but your vendor devices should never, ever be talking DNS up to random AWS. Right. <laughs> Seems obvious, but not everybody's catching that, right? So. Yeah, exactly. There's, right. there's just not enough of that basic blocking and tackling going on around these devices. Right. Are there things like um, asset management tools or other parts of the, you know, the standard IT infrastructure that security teams need to invest more time and energy into? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, asset management is fundamental to your ability to really do security properly. You're never going to be able to defend what you don't know is there. Um, and, you know, case in point, my father is a programmer for a large healthcare organization. Um, and he was telling me when this broke that it was like three days before they were even able to figure out where all of their SolarWinds servers were. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, and it, it, it's understandable if you don't have 100% coverage of, you know, 100,000 crazy devices across a massive organization. But it's just ridiculous that here in 2021, we wouldn't have uh, an easy handle on all of our critical vendor devices and, and other production servers. Um, so, you know, I think absolutely there should be a focus, you know, really not just on asset management, although that's step one, but understanding what those assets do on a regular basis and, and being able to see deviations off of that norm. Um, in, you know, I know that's, that's always like people talk about um, network behavioral anomaly detection and user behavior analytics, and it, it's got its drawbacks in terms of trying to do that on an automated basis. You know, maybe if you're, you put it in in the middle of that breach, it's not going to notice something different off of the baseline. Um, but the, the level of scrutiny that you can apply to, you know, crown jewel assets like that, um, to be able to say, for example, going back to the fact that this exfiltration for the SolarWinds devices took place over SSL, well, the certificates on those SSL connections were actually saying that the, the FAR domain was something that was not hosted on SolarWinds.com. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's very easy um, to, you know, run a query that just says, okay, for these production devices, what are they connecting to? That's going to stick out like a sore thumb and any vendor worth their salt, if you put a ticket in and say, hey, why is this device making a connection to this place is going to be able to tell you exactly what is going on, why that's expected. Or, you know, in the case of this, if it wasn't that that could have easily been the tip off that led to this whole thing being discovered. No, that's that's tremendous insight there. What are some best practices or strategies you're seeing companies implement? really to find and prevent these types of attacks in the future? Yeah, so I, I think it's about making sure that you have that base layer of visibility into your network um, that is, you know, non-judgmental upfront. Um, and what I mean by that is you think about IDSs and proxies and firewalls and all these other network monitoring tools, um, they're very dependent on having some sort of set of signatures or list of ACLs mm -hmm. or whatever that, that is a known set of things that they're going to be flagging on and going after. Um, but, you know, all of those devices would have missed this attack in progress because nobody knew that right. ABS VM cloud.com meant anything going into this. And so just having, you know, the, the raw information about what the heck all of your devices you're doing 
so that you can actually then go and apply this logic of you know, hygiene or, or other sorts of behavioral anomaly detection. And again, whether that's manual or automated or whatever, um, you've got to have that foundation of visibility in order to be able to get ahead of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on that point, um, what do you see in some of the biggest gaps in organization security stacks? Is it just that visibility or is, is there more to it? Well, I mean, I, I think the visibility is a big part of it. Um, and part of, of the reason visibility is so poor um, is not just you know, the, the lack of context-free logging, it's that you know, companies are, are taking all of these different app servers, security devices, whatever, putting all of their logs into a central SIM somewhere. Um, and then they, they end up with this big pile of junk that they have to go through and massage and normalize and, and try to get into some sort of functional shape to get a coherent picture out of. Um, and, and so there's this operational gap between, yes, I've got the data and yes, I can actually search it efficiently and find something within it. Um, that, that's a big part of what I think needs to be addressed. Yeah, no, I, I've heard the term on that one. Um, everybody wanting to implement a data lake and ending up with a data swamp. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah, it's very true. I mean, when something as dumb as timestamp skew can throw off your whole schema, yeah, you know, we've got problems. Uh, well, on that point, uh, you know, you, you talk about the the being able to make sense of all the data. You know, part of it also what we're hearing a lot of is is really just and it's I, it's an overused term in my mind, but alert fatigue, right? Simply too many alarms uh, and too many things for SecOps analysts and their teams to look at are really preventing them from elevating from this reactionary to more proactive threat hunting efforts, Yeah, which would help find these types of threats. Are there things organizations can do to kind of change that paradigm and help themselves with this challenge? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a question of having that, that data and logging tied into the alerts as directly as possible. Mm -hmm. and. You know, to, to toot our own horn a little bit, uh, one of the things Corelight has done with our implementation of Suricata is tied it directly into Zeek by way of the UID that's done on a per connection basis in Zeek. And what that means fundamentally is that when you get an alert, you've got a single ID that lets you pivot into all the layer seven details around the involved sessions. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to be able to see and understand the context around that alert um, and be able to kind of dispose of it one way or the other much more quickly than having to go type a bunch of other queries or touch a bunch of other consoles. Um, and, you know, part of what that leads to as well is automation. Um, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in SOAR, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, a big commercial implementation like a, a Phantom or a Cortex or even just an in-home, you know, sort of a scripting solution. Um, but being able to do things like, well, I've got a thousand alerts for PHP file uploads against my web server farm, but every single one of them came back as 404s. You know, you've just knocked out a, a ton of work in something that can take zero analyst time with some very, you know, clean, clean crisp sort of logic that you don't have to worry about defending later on down the road. No, oh, that's a great point. So looking forward, Alex, one of the things we like to ask our experts that come on, what do you recommend our listeners um, one thing to really look out for or think about over the next six to 18 months as, as there's this constant shifting battle for cyber and network security? Well, I mean, I, I think the likelihood of some other supply chain attack popping up is actually probably pretty high at this point. Um, and I think it's it's more likely to come out of a like a network operations vendor device than a security operations device, just because the folks that run network operations device companies are typically less security oriented. And so the attackers are probably going to get in via that route instead. Um, but, you know, I also think that if we talk about the this half moon exchange vulnerability that has you know, gotten to the point that the FBI is literally talking about going out and using the exploit to go patch boxes and kick web shells off of them. Um, I, I think part of what the future holds is very much the same things that the past has held. 
Um, a lot of the, the same techniques that ransomware and you know, other automated exploitation methods are, are using for the last 10 or 20 years are still perfectly valid. Um, and a, a lot of the security processes that, that leave these sorts of holes open aren't closing anytime soon. Um, and so I think you're going to continue to see a lot of, you know, the same things you've seen in the past. And that's why it's so important for organizations to try to really paradigm shift and, and think about how they can streamline their operations so that, you know, for example, on the patching side of the house, one of the things we called out at Tenable um, was that, you know, a very small percentage of the total number of vulnerabilities you have in house being closed off could prevent an outsized portion of the actual exploitation events. Um, and so companies being able to target the things that need patching, understanding what's on their network, putting that same level of extra human scrutiny onto, you know, particular devices that, that matter within the network um, can really put folks ahead of the curve um, and help them escape a lot of the day-to-day the -day nonsense that's affecting so much of the marketplace. Alex, that's just tremendous insight. So thank you so much for joining, sharing your experience in how to better secure networks. We'd ask our listeners to tune in next time for another edition of the Enday's Packet Forensic Files. For more information about Endace's network packet capture platform and our integrations with our fusion partners like Corelight, please go to endace.com. Alex, again, thanks for taking some time with us and have a great day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.